everyone to today's seminar. It is my absolute pleasure to um, introduce Ginny, who works on interdisciplinary, on, um, is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for World Policy Research. But uh, Ginny brings together her background in literature, science communication, and sociology to tackle rewilding in Britain. Her approach is really holistic and goes in, in one health perspective. So without further ado, um, Jenny, I'll let you go. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you very much for coming and thank you very much to the GSI for having me. So my previous research has looked at rewilding and my current research looks at reintroductions and I take a really environmental social science perspective to this and part of what the GSI invited me to talk about was the, the socio-political and socio-cultural relations involved in, in rewilding and reintroduction so I'm going to try and do that. Um, I'm going to really focus on declining biodiversity um, and just started my watch, um, time myself. And the European Commission have identified declining biodiversity as one of the greatest threats, um, greatest global threats alongside climate change. So it really is in humanity's interest to address this, but it's, but it's also just in, in the moral interest to address it um, for its intrinsic value. Um, which obviously aligns with the interests of the GSI facing up to global challenges and, and finding sort of solutions for mutual flourishing. So that is what I'm going to talk about, I hope. Um, so it's, it's really going to be a talk of two, well, two halves, more like two thirds, one third. I'm going to talk about my previous research on rewilding and I'll try to roughly evenly split my time, but there is a little bit more to talk about here just because I've written more about this so far. So this is basically going to save you having to read anything I've ever written. Um, so I'll just run, I'll basically give you a, the executive summary of my papers. And then I'm going to talk about um, reintroductions, which is what I'm working on currently, um, particularly, a, reintroductions of the red kite and the wild the european wildcat in britain um, and then what i'll try and do is bring all that together at the end to talk about um sustainable land use which is one of the things that the gsi were particularly interested that i talk about so i better at least make an effort um, and then maybe that can kick us off into a discussion at the end yeah Let's let's start with domesticating rewilding. So my research looked at um, rewilding in England and I didn't I didn't propose my own um, definition of rewilding because there are so many. There's now a really, really good one um, from the IUCN, which I think um, is, there's really good arguments for adopting that. The IU, if it's good enough for the IUCN, it's kind of good enough for me. But when I was doing this research, there were all these sort of competing definitions and it, I didn't feel the need to add another one to it. But what I did was looked at family resemblance factors, factors that I thought you could look at a conservation approach and decide if it had some or any or all of these factors and that might help you decide whether it was or wasn't rewilding um, because so many things are rewilding. So I looked at whether something self-identified as rewilding, what scale it operated at, and, and the idea was rewilding usually happened at large scale, whether it was intending or actually in, intending to or actually increasing by increased biodiversity, whether it was intending to or actually increasing ecological functioning, whether it was intending to or actually reducing human intervention, and whether it was intending to or actually increasing other than human or natural agency. So those were my kind of ideas of what made something a case of rewilding not. And then I looked at what that meant in England. Um, 
and particularly in the English socio-cultural context and how all those things changed and they changed a lot and I, I decided that what this meant was that rewilding in England was being domesticated basically being adapted to fit alongside alongside people and other land use so rewilding becomes wilding or wild or wilder people drop the re or, or tend to I actually think it's starting to sneak back in a bit now it was a while when rewilding was a really unpopular term and now I think it's getting uh, people are getting a lot more comfortable with it that's that's England specifically um one of the things I'm actually looking at now is a bit of a broader comparison of rewilding in Britain more generally. So comparing England with Scotland and Wales and, and the way rewilding is used even within those three nations is quite different. But, but in England, there's this tendency to say wild, wilder, wilding rather than rewilding. Um, it happens at a small scale. Um, or it can happen at a small scale, it can happen at a large scale, but it can happen at much smaller scales than in other places. Um, and what I should say is, I'm not necessarily saying any of this is right or wrong, or good or bad, I'm saying this is what's happening in England. Um, and some real advocates of and proponents of rewilding don't particularly like this because they see it as a dilution um, of, of this real um core rewilding idea that came came to us originally from the united states um so but i'm not i'm not suggesting that we do this i'm saying that people are doing it but i think what people worry about is that even by talking about it um we're perpetuating it but nevertheless this is what i think is happening so that's scale. Then the other thing that I'm interested or thought was interesting was biodiversity is being increased, but some of it is functional diversity. So sometimes um, instead of reintroducing a wild animal, a domestic animal is being used as an analogue for that wild species. If it, if it doesn't exist any longer, if it's extinct, or if it's just too difficult to reintroduce it in the English context. Um, so ecological functioning is increasing, but because of some of those other little modifications, like maybe smaller scale, maybe functional diversity, ecological processes might not be being restored as fully as um, we might hope, but they are still nevertheless um, being restored to some extent. Um, and then because, again, because of all these things, because it's slightly smaller scale, because you don't necessarily have your full um, um, suite of species, and because you don't have full ecological functioning, you do still have some human intervention, um, quite targeted human intervention. And the good thing about that in the, the English cultural context is that it means you can have this ongoing active human management of the land which is really important because of our farming history and then the last thing the last modification is that because of all those previous things your your natural agency your other than human agency maybe isn't increasing as much as you would aspire for it to but it is still increasing to some extent so it's it's just this this tailored version of rewilding was my theory so that's that. That's re rewilding in England. And then from that, from that idea of domesticated or domesticating rewilding, kind of um, extrapolated even further into this idea of agricultural rewilding, which is this idea that you can take rewilding, this kind of modified version of it, and you can take really extensive agriculture and somewhere in this overlap you get agricultural rewilding which is this idea where you can still have food production and you can still have the ecological gains of rewilding and so it's it's this kind of win-win situation supposedly you could also argue it's a lose-lose situation depending it's whether you're kind of glass half empty glass half full you know 
there's definitely compromises on both sides. You don't get as much food, you don't get as much ecological gains, but you get some ecological gains and you get some food. So, you know, you pay your money and you take your choice. But the, the idea of this was that you, you could continue agriculture. So you, you've got that cultural context, you've got human management of the land, um, which supports livelihoods and communities. And you don't get some of the concerns about rewilding, like outsourcing of food production, um, reduction in food self-sufficiency. And because you're outsourcing food production, you're sort of outsourcing your environmental degradation. And you do still get some of your ecological gains. Um, the, the, so the, yeah, the, and the idea is that you will get a little bit low quality, low, sorry, low quantity, high quality meat. I haven't seen any suggestions of how this could be done with arable agriculture. This is all pastoral. Um, so th this is basically using those, those um, functional um, analogs. So basically it's your large herbivores who are performing conservation or naturalistic grazing, um, but they're domestic animals as opposed to wild animals and we're, we're harvesting them for food production. You could, and you can also argue, apart from environmentally sustainable and financially sustainable, this is ethically sustainable, leaving aside the argument over whether or not we want to eat meat at all. If you do want to eat meat, you might suggest that this is a, a good way of producing meat. So let's have a look, probably should have done this the other way around, but let's have a look at some of the people involved in rewilding in England. Um, and I, I should say that these are proponents of rewilding or advocates of it. I, I, I didn't mention in, in this bit of research, or I didn't look at opponents of whom there are many and various. But let's, let's focus on the positive for now. Um, so these are the people who are sort of driving the socio-political agenda for rewilding in England, but also arguably in Britain as well, and possibly in other parts of the world. So pioneer farmers, first of all, up here in the top left. These are farmers who are early adopters of the idea of rewilding. Um, and I mean, I suppose, I suppose the classic examples are Charlie and Isabella Burrell at um, NEP, which is the classic example of rewilding in England. So they, they do something that is supposedly or perceived as risky and either make a success of it or not, or say they do and encourage other people to to follow in their footsteps. And what's important about that is that if they're, if they're farmers, other farmers are much more likely to listen to them than someone like this person who I'll talk about in a minute, a policy entrepreneur who is telling farming, it's the farmers that something is a good idea. They're unlikely to listen. They're much more likely to listen to someone who's one of their peers. So policy entrepreneurs, these are people who are pushing the rewilding agenda for some reason, probably to suit their own ideological aims, but they're lobbying government, they're, they're trying to shape policy so that it's favourable to rewilding. And the, the, I know we keep going on about it, but there's, there's still this perceived policy moment after Brexit because um, we've left the, com the European Union, we've also left the common agricultural policy, which means agri-environment policy in Britain is being reviewed. Um, in England, with the environmental land management schemes coming in, it's going to be different in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, but in all cases, it's a chance to review agri-environment policy. And these policy entrepreneurs are really seizing that moment and trying to drive the agenda for rewilding, if that's what's interesting, they're interested in. Uh, this sofa is me meant to represent armchair rewilders. So this is 
drawn from the idea of armchair travel. Armchair rewilders are people who don't live near rewilding sites, in or near, don't even necessarily go to them, but they like the idea of them. Um, I would say George Mondio is the classic example of this. If anyone's read Feral, I mean, he was incredibly influential in, in the rewilding discourse in Britain. Um, he's moved on now, you know, he's, he's very toad of toad hall onto the next thing, but he had a huge influence on, on the rewilding debate in, in Britain while he was interested in it. And then, excuse the icon, this is because I'm quite limited in the icons I could find on PowerPoint. Um, this is meant to represent guerrilla rewilding, as in guerrilla warfare, not as in rewilding the primate. <laughs> guerrilla rewilding, and I've had, it's, when I tell people I look at guerrilla rewilding, they're like, in print, really? I'm like, oh no, different guerrilla. Um, guerrilla rewilders, they're there, and they are definitely driving the kind of, the rewilding landscape in England, in Britain, they're very, very hard to research. So these are people who are not necessarily following the legal procedures, but they're, they're rewild, they're illegal, releasing species illegally, they're um, changing landscapes, um, and they're actually having a really significant impact because um, uh, the, the beaver on the river otter are a really good example. They were there, um, they weren't there officially, and yet because they existed there and flourished there, um, they were able to be legitimized. They were turned into a, a trial and then they stayed. And, and that's a really good example of how a guerrilla activity can uh, can forward an agenda and become legitimate. Um, after I wrote this paper, I had an email from a, an investigative journalist and said, tell me what you know. I was like, I don't know anything. <laughs> I, what I know is in the paper. There's, there's like about a, a line in there. Um, and I said, but if you find anything, please let me know. Because um, it's, it's so difficult to research these people because no one's going to put their hand up and go, oh, yeah, I did that. Uh, so let's look at the other than humans involved in rewilding in England. And I'm using cows as an example, but this in theory could apply to other species. Um, all these cows look the same, all these icons. Again, that's partly the limitations of the icons, but also it's because in theory, all these cows are in different roles, but they can also be in more than one role at the same time and they can move between them. So actually, I mean, I'm framing it as deliberate, I mean, it's partly, but you know, that's my way of explaining why they all look the same. So it's no bad thing. And I'm talking about cows because the, Large herbivores are a, a big element of rewilding in England. Um, and really, you've got three options. You've got cows, ponies, deer. And cows, I argue, are the, the tool of choice because deer are difficult. Deer are wild and we don't particularly eat them. Horses are domestic and we definitely don't eat them. Cows are domestic and we do eat them. So when you decide you've got too many cows, you just eat them. You can't, it's much harder to do that with ponies and deer. So that's why it's that cows are quite a nice safe choice. So you could in theory apply this to other species, but I'll talk about cows today. So first of all, looking, thinking back to that idea of rewilding and natural autonomy and functional diversity. The first role of cows or species in rewilding in England is as self-determining agents. They have far more agency than their intensively farmed counterparts. Um, so I looked, I should have said, um, I looked at the Avalon Marshes near Glastonbury and Somerset and Wild Ennerdale in the Lake District in Cumbria as my case sites. And they have 
black Galloway cattle in Wild Ennerdale who basically have the run of the valley. They're, they don't have fences. They're topographically challenged. So they're, they're, they're fenced in by the fells. And they, they could, in theory, leave the valley, but they don't. Um, so they, but they have a huge amount of agency about where they go within this valley compared to a cow in a field in Devon that has far less agency. Um, the next one is species as analogues. So this is what I talked about earlier with that functional diversity is these animals are being introduced as an analogue for some wild counterpart. And they'll, they'll, they'll be sort of fulfilling or filling rather an ecological niche and doing something like naturalistic grazing. The next one um, is a species or an animal as a proxy for humans. So they're, they're performing a role for us. We're, we're getting them to do our ecological restoration work for us. So we're deliberately putting them in an ecosystem for the role they play. Um, so that could be conservation grazing, it, it could be whatever it is another species does. And then the last one is as expendable objects. Um, so this is when your food production comes in, you decide you've had enough of that animal being in that ecosystem, I mean, and you, you take it out, quite literally, if you're harvesting it for meat production, but the animals can be slotted in or out of ecosystems. Um, they don't, they could be moved, they don't necessarily have to be slaughtered. And the, the point of this is it's not about them. They're ex entirely disposable, fungible. Their role could be fulfilled by another animal, even another species. So this is actually something I'm really interested in. I, um, the way that other than human animals are governed in um, rewilding projects. However, moving swiftly on, so this, this is my current research. So this is my research about reintroductions in Britain now. So all the stuff on rewilding was specifically on England. Um, I, I do think it could be applied to um, Britain more broadly and possibly even other places, but my research particularly focused on England. My research on reintroductions is on Britain as a whole. So England, Wales and Scotland. And the first species I've looked at is the red kite, which is native to Britain. It was once widespread um, and it was reintroduced about 30 years ago. So this, this very detailed timeline, the, the kite at the top is being valued. Um, when you look at the conservation history of kites in Britain, everyone sort of takes the medieval period as, as a time when kites were really valued for the role they played in human society. They're a scavenger. So they, they were in cities and they were seen as cleaning up cities and people really valued them for that. Um, then things changed and they became persecuted. They, they were classified as vermin and there was literally a price on their head. You could shoot a few kites shoot, I don't know, however one kills a kite um, in the Middle Ages and, and get the bounty on their heads. Um, then, and now I have to get this right, then they became valued again, but that didn't mean they were any better off. Um, they became rare because they'd been so heavily persecuted but people didn't protect them. They hunted them even more because they were like, oh, there aren't many of these. Let's go and find a rare kite and stuff it or get its eggs. So they became really valued by taxidermists and egg collectors, but not protected, which is unusual in today's way of thinking. We usually think when we value something, we protect it. Um, then eventually they became valued when there was, I. So they were completely gone from England and Scotland. There were a few in mid Wales, and it's I can I can never remember whether it was one or two breeding females left, but you know they, it was that few. 
and so finally went, oh, oh, we'd better look after these kites. So we did. Um, and there was this really intensive reintroduction effort and they've been restored. And again, depending on your point of view, depending on your definition of success, there, it has been a successful reintroduction in terms of numbers. There are now thousands of kites in Britain. Um, but then this is why there's this last kite on screen um, persecuted question mark. It may be that there are now so many kites that we're starting to not value them again. We're starting to consider them a pest because they're so numerous, which is so interesting in terms of our attitude to animals, how we value them, how we don't value them. Um, yeah, how we consider something a pest or not. And um, so, oh, what I, what I should have said, um, getting sidetracked, is that the, my way into all of this, all of this kite reintroduction and wildcat reintroduction is through feeding. So as part of this reintroduction program, when we started valuing them, we fed them first in captivity um, before they were released. Then we um, gave them supplementary feeding after they were released to support them in the wild. And that feeding has continued, but it's now morphed into tourism feeding because the kites no longer need support. Um, but you get hundreds of kites coming to feeding stations. So I've visited three feeding sites in Scotland and three feeding sites in Wales. Um, and there are hundreds of kites at these sites and it's incredible. And um, people love to visit. And the whole, um, yeah, it, even though it's not benefiting those kites directly, it's benefiting other kites and other raptors, other wildlife, because you can have conversations with visitors about conservation and so on. And this is me at Bulchnantiarian, which is one of the red kite feeding stations near Aberystwyth, feeding the kites, which was fantastic. So, a slide um, and then all right I'm just stop working oh, 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 oh there's probably more to do with me than anything else ah thank go. you brilliant um the other species i look at is the european wildcat so like the red kite the european wildcat is native to Britain and like the red kite it had been seriously reduced mostly through well entirely through persecution and habitat destruction so there are just a few wildcats left in Scotland no longer any in Britain uh, in England or Wales and what has happened is because there are now so few wildcats it's very difficult for them to find a mate. And so they're, they're often mating with the domestic cat, even though they're different species, they're interfertile and they produce a viable offspring. So what you then get is this hybrid. Um, and that, that's now kind of contributing to the decline of the wild cat. It, it's both cause and effect. It, it, the original decline was because of persecution and habitat destruction, but then they got so low in number that they started hybridizing, and now that's a problem because, or perceived to be a problem because you've got hybrid animals affecting the genetic wildness of, of wildcats. So, um, wildcat feeding is really, well, to actually, first, Wildcats are now really, really valued because there are so few of them. I and mean, it's arguable whether there are any. Because of this hybridization, there may not be any pure wildcats in Scotland, therefore in Britain at all. There are some free living wildcats or some free living cats 
they might be hybrids, they might be wildcats. And, and this is the question, does, does it matter whether, whether they're pure wildcats, if they're in the environment, in the ecosystem, filling an ecological niche? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. It matters a lot to the people who are reintroducing them. So there's, there's big projects to reintroduce the European wildcat in, in Scotland, England and Wales. The one in Scotland is far more advanced than the ones in England and Wales. They've got 20 wildcat kittens that are going to be released next month in the Cairngorms. Um, and they've got a really elaborate um, captive breeding facility in the Cairngorms. There are also plans to reintroduce them in Wales and England, almost certainly in Devon. Um, the wildcats are being bred in Devon. Um, they're, they're in the process of identifying release sites for, for England and Wales. Um, so at the moment, cats are being fed in captivity. And this is one of the things I've been looked at, the sort of really sophisticated ways that people are feeding animals in captivity to prepare them for once they're released. And you're not allowed to feed live prey in Britain. So these cats have to be fed. I was going to say cat food, but obviously it's not cat food, but they're not, they're not fed live prey. So they have to be fed in sophisticated ways. So that in order to sort of teach them to hunt, essentially. And then there's a big question over whether they will be supplementary fed once they're released. The idea in Scotland is that they won't be because they're very interested in the sort of wild integrity of the cats and they feel that if they intervene um, the cats won't be behaviourally wild. Um, the idea in Wales is that they will really really heavily supplementary feed them because they're not worried about the wildness of the cats go, that go out, they're worried that they survive um, and they're like if you know if that means I have to um, sort of interfere with their natural agency to some extent, I'd rather do that than, than risk them dying. So um, it's that really interesting trade-off between how wild you want something to be, how much you want to intervene, how much you want to influence outcomes, which I think is really interesting. So, last slide. This is how it all comes together, supposedly. Um, in terms of sustainable land use, which is what well, obviously one of the things the GSI are really interested in. And I'm just gonna read this because I looked it up and I think it's important. Um, in 2019, the IEPCC identified sustainable land use as land and food systems provide the principal basis for human livelihoods and well-being, including the supply of food, fresh water and multiple other ecosystem services. So we'll leave aside how anthropocentric that is. Um, there is a real emphasis on food there. And I think that is because um, conservation is really competing in terms of land area with food production. That, that is our dominant land use. Um, 10 million hectares of forest are lost every year to deforestation, 90% of which is due to agriculture. So um, when we're, we're talking about conservation, rewilding, increasing biodiversity, that's, that's what we're sort of trying to balance, that's the trade-off we're making between food production and, and conservation, biodiversity restoration. And I think that's why things like agricultural rewilding are interesting. You can say they're a really pragmatic response, they are, um, but particularly in England and Britain where we are very land limited and we said that rewilding happens at smaller areas, we are having to share land between food production and conservation rather than spare land for conservation. Um, and I think that's why um, rewilding is being adapted so much 
in in England, in Britain, compared to other countries. And I think that's why you can have that sort of, the, yeah, that land sharing approach. I also think it's really interesting in terms of species reintroductions and our tolerance for other species, which um, really the red kite probably illustrates. We're, we're so unused to sharing our land, our space with other species, that the minute there are more red kites than there used to be, we sort of say, well, this is too many red kites, <laughs> which is that shifting baseline syndrome. You know, if there had always been that many red kites, we'd just go, meh, that's red kites for you. Perhaps in the way that we do with gulls. Although that's, that's interesting too. But um, because they've been reintroduced, we have to learn to tolerate them again and coexist with them. And um, Roger Oster, who's done a lot of work on beaver reintroductions, talks about renewed coexistence, which I think is really interesting. And I'm going to use his work um, because he says, we have to stop thinking about these species as reintroduced species. We have to see them as part of our landscape again. And that's what we're not good at at the moment. We're very good at saying, um, you know, beaver have had an impact on my agricultural land, I therefore want compensation for that. No one asks compensation when a fox eats their chickens, that's just how it is, because no one's reintroduced the fox, so it's, it's all that idea of human intervention and responsibility. Um, bother, I had another point. Uh, which I now can't remember, which is going to make this tail off in a very disappointing fashion and un unsatisfactory. But, um, oh, wildcats. I think they're a really good example of it. Um, a lot of people I talk to don't even know what a wildcat is. Um, and a lot of people I interview who work to reintroduce wildcats, their friends and family don't know what a wildcat is, even though... I, these people I interview have been working to reintroduce wildcats for years and then they'll talk to their friends about it and they're like what is a wildcat and they're like what do you think I do um but talking of coexistence people are really concerned about wildcats being reintroduced in Britain because they don't know what they are people think that they're they're going to get eaten their children are going to get eaten their dogs cats rabbits cattle are going to get eaten wildcats are the size of a house cat, give or take. Um, but what we're starting to see is kind of concern about the reintroduction of these species, calls for compensation for you know loss and damage to livestock. And it will be perhaps particularly a problem with um, things like game shooting. Um, and it's game shooting states that have historically persecuted wildcats and potentially will continue to do so. So if, if we're bringing these species back, it's not enough just to bring them back. We have to think about how we, how we coexist with them. And in that idea of renewed coexistence, which I think is really helpful. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jenny. That was really, really good. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, so we're going to start off now with question time. We've got a few in the chat, but I think we could start in the room. So does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? Yes, I'd back. Hi, Jenny. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Really, really interesting. Um, nice to see what you've been working on. Um, I had a question I was interested in how you were talking about uh, people's changing attitudes to red kite reintroductions and the fact that they were you know, there was this groundswell of support for red kites and then now it's shifting away again. I guess I have two sub questions. One is um, I wasn't really aware that people had been sort of turning against red kites again. Is that something that you've actually sort of seen? And is that um, are you, what are the driving factors? Because red kites are not. It wasn't originally that they were thought to be pests because they killed things and they didn't realise they were scavengers. But so what is the driving force of, of that now? I think there still is concern that they're killing killing lambs. You still see that, um, even if they are scavenging dead lambs or possibly dying lambs. Um, but 
I must admit, it hasn't come up in my in. Actually, it has come up in my interviews, but I've seen it more in the media in areas where red kites are prevalent, which are particularly the southeast, because there are very, very few in the southwest still. Um, is there's this kind of red kite ate my baby type narrative? <laughs> <laughs> A toddler scratched in pushchair when red kite steals biscuit and you're like he is lucky to be alive <laughs> <laughs> um so there's yeah they're, they're being portrayed as kind of pests and a nuisance and conflicting with people and the, the thing is they're really not frightened of people they're they're um not uh not a shy bird at all so they will they'll really take advantage of of human habitats um so yeah but you, you do you get people talking about them as a nuisance and, because there are so many um we have one online but a question that i had links quite nicely onto that so i'll just put myself forward and ask one as well um, I've seen that we've been having some introduction of some really large animals in Britain um, but you know bigger than cows it's the bison how on the topic of people being scared of you know these these fairly small animals have you encountered anything about bison? Well, the bison are really interesting because there aren't that many of them there's so this is so Wildwood which is just up the road just north of Exeter has a sister site in Kent, also called Wildwood, where they have a very small herd of bison, which are fenced in there. And this is, this is where we can really get into the weeds of what is and isn't rewilding and does it involve fences. And it really it's how you frame it. There are bison in England in zoos, and now there are bison in England in a rewilding project so it really does depend on how you frame it but they're they're not people are not concerned mostly because then they are enclosed and people are not coming into contact with those bison at all what's interesting is i've seen that bison enclosure the the bison are enclosed by a um, sort of really heavy duty electric fence, three strands of hot wire, they call it, just to sound scary. But they said that was relatively cheap. What was really, really expensive was the second fence outside that to keep the people out rather than keep the people in. And it's, it really is, I mean, it's, it, I mean, there's so much work to be done on fences and rewilding and conservation. But um, yeah, that idea of, of keeping animals apart or humans and animals apart to avoid human wildlife conflict is, is really interesting and, and it allow a harmonious coexistence even if that means segregation. Okay interesting well then let's move to one online. Um, uh, of, from Zoe James uh, on land sharing. In Regenesis George Monbiot writes that if 10% of UK farmland were managed like NEP probably pronouncing that wrong, no, no, would right. be able to eat meat on average three times a year, which suggests that the meat production in that context is a bit beside the point. Do you have any thoughts on that? Regenesis is totally on my reading list and I haven't read it. <laughs> um, that's an interesting statistic, isn't it? I mean, I, I definitely knew that these these kind of agricultural rewilding projects are are very low output so low low quantity high quality and there is an argument for i mean there's a huge argument for changing our meat consumption um whether there's willingness to do that is another matter um and and the difficulty is you really do then get that idea of outsourcing of of meat production because it's all very well saying let's do agricultural rewilding, let's do the net model of regenerative agriculture, um, but it means that this meat that's produced is, is very high value, it's high price, which means, and you, you could say that's good, it's price limiting, if, if meat was priced to its true value, if its environmental value as well as its economic value, then perhaps I would be able to afford it only three times a year and it would go back to being a real luxury. Are we prepared to do that? Probably not, especially not 
when we can import really cheap meat. And then we get that problem of even though we've we've got great ecological restoration here, if we there's still a huge demand for for high volume cheap meat, we're just outsourcing our environmental degradation. Okay, really interesting. This next question ties into a bit um, of that as well. What does it mean from Tim Malone? What does it mean for an animal to be valued? Economic value, ecosystem services value, or just liked because of their perceived mystic beauty or current rarity? What is valued about wildness? Oh, who is Tim and can he and I write a paper? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a brilliant question. I, I, I don't know, and all of it, like there's, yeah. It, philosophically, you can definitely argue that animals have intrinsic value, um, and that, that ties into the whole, um, should we even be eating these animals to start with? But yeah, we really do value them for the role they play in ecosystems. But you can argue that that's quite unethical as well, because we're just exploiting them in a different way. We're getting them to do our ecological restoration dirty work for us. I mean, if you think back of the way kites were valued for their scavenging role, you know, it's, it's a really utilitarian use of use of animals or perception. With, with wildcat reintroductions, some of the people are sort of saying, oh, yeah, wouldn't it be great if wildcats could come back and eat all the rats on my farm? It's like, well, that's not really why we're reintroducing them. But sure, you know, it's really interesting how we, we value these animals. Um, so, yes, they have an economic value to people who depend on it for their livelihoods. I um, can't remember the other thing he said, but it was brilliant. Um, wildness. I Wildness is this, uh, this is where I need a philosopher. What's that thing where it's just sort of taken as a, like it's an irreducible point. You, you take it back and back and back and you just go, no, this is just good. I think wildness is one of those things for us. Um, it's seen as a, a sort of inherent good Quite why is interesting, you know, we really romanticize it. It didn't used to be that way. Wildness used to be seen as bad and barbaric and savage. So I think probably the romantic period has a lot to answer for in terms of making this value wildness. I mean, the, possibly where this question comes from is the wildcat, where I was sort of talking about the value of wildness. I think that, is perhaps in terms of species, you know, we value individual species, we value genetics. In terms of conservation, there's, there's always been a, a focus on purity as opposed to hybrids, which have been sort of not valued in conservation often. Um, and the wildcat's valued, really valued culturally now. Um, it's, I didn't talk about it, but it, for a long time it was called the Scottish wildcat because it, in, in this country it existed <laughs> in Scotland. Um, and now people are trying to shift away from that um, because it's going to be reintroduced in Wales and England. So, so you, can't have, you can't reintroduce the Scottish wildcat to England, that's stupid. So we're having to go back to calling it the European wildcat. But, but part of sort of a bit chicken and egg part of the reason it was called the Scottish wildcat and part of what it being called the Scottish wildcat meant was that it was culturally very significant in Scotland and has been for a really long time like it's associated with a lot of the clans it's a huge amount of marketing around Scottish wildcats in Scotland everything's wildcat biscuits wildcat shoe polish you know it's, Okay, thank you. Um, and then on to the next one from Mark. Is there a potential problem that generally we're reintroducing individual species? So there may be a problem as boar or beaver numbers increase because we haven't reintroduced those animals which would prey on them and keep their numbers under control. Yeah, and this is where thinking back to that picture I had of domesticating rewilding in England, which I should have said was um, done by a fantastic artist called Fanny Didu and organised by the Green Futures Network at Exeter. Um, 
because in England, some of those factors relating to rewilding are being modified, it has this knock-on effect. So if you're not reintroducing a full suite of species, what it means is you haven't got all your ecological processes like predation. And so what that then means is you have to have, well, you might have to have targeted human interventions to, to sort of replace those missing ecological processes. So, so culling in of certain species in the absence of the species that would normally predate them. Which is why cows are so good to reintroduce because you can shoot them and then eat them. Or however you slaughter cows. Um, but, but there's that question of how you how we should be managing wildlife if at all and how we should be approaching our food so you know there's there's talk there's um huge efforts to cull red deer in scotland but do we eat enough venison um and uh, i don't know if anyone eats beaver anymore i know we used to but is anyone going to be prepared to eat beaver is there a moral argument over whether if you're going to cull a species because it's seen as too too numerous is it better to eat it than just kill it and it be wasted? Depending on how you how you view waste and use and value and all those things. Wow, big, big <laughs> question there. Um, I can keep reading the ones from my own. We've got quite a few, but if anyone in the room has a question, please just raise your hand. Oh, yeah, Michelle. Um, yeah, I was wondering, so you mentioned uh, child murdering red kites <laughs> um, <laughs> in tabloids and such. Yeah. So there's clearly like work that needs to be done on like the public's perception and relationship with animals and, and the and wildness and the environment. Um, so I was curious how you feel about like zoos or those kind of, like you mentioned the feeding towers, like the touristy kind of things, mm -hmm. like is there, yeah, how you feel about them and like how they can best be utilized. Sure. Yeah. Um, really broadly speaking, you could talk about conservation feeding, which is this really broad umbrella for just about any feeding of wildlife that is, is meant to benefit the wildlife. So um, that picture of me feeding red kites at a red kite feeding station, even though it's not benefiting the kites directly, it is having an educational purpose. Yeah. Um, there are risks in that, you know, if, with things like bird flu, with massive aggregations of birds, um, there are potential risks as well as potential benefits. Zoos, um, there are people on our project looking at zoos specifically because they're so interesting, especially in relation to feeding and human-animal interactions. And there's a huge overlap between feeding of animals in zoos and feeding of animals for conservation, particularly for release. So in captivity, pre-release and then post-release. Um, and one of the zoo narratives is, is very much conservation, either preserving the species um, in captivity or with the potential for release. So it's, it's arguably really important that Captive animals are fed in such a way as to equip them for survival in the wild, should they ever be released, even, even in zoos, supposedly. Um, but zoos do have a huge educational role to play. Uh, it, it, uh, it depends on the zoo. It's, it's a bit arguable in a lot of cases how much of a, a real conservation and educational role they have and how much is just pure entertainment it's, it's definitely changed it used to be 100 percent entertainment now now it's shifting and it will probably shift more i mean um whatever you think of their approach and however successful it is the aspinall foundation and their sort of have a, a an idea they run zoos and their idea is that zoos should be abolished I'm not sure when within their lifetime or something like that it's like it's pretty it's pretty ambitious I don't, i'm not sure if they I think it's perhaps more of an aspirational target than anything else, but it's, it's an interesting question. 
Okay, we'll go back to online for one more question and then we'll have time for one more question in the room. Uh, going back to the topic of beavers, the reintroduction of, be of beavers seems to have been particularly contentious. Is an acceptable kind of species we can introduce or is it all down to the narrative around the introduction? Ooh. Um, I don't know very much about beaver. I don't, I don't know why it was contentious unless it was because it was done um, sort of I don't, know, I don't know if I should say legally, but done without license to begin with. And because there is this concern over impact on, on land and trees with flooding and tree felling, acceptable animals to reintroduce small, small, non-dangerous ones. We're so unambitious. Um, yeah, the smaller and the less dangerous, the better. But it, but it is about framing, definitely. And if what's that thing where if you sort of say you've got a 10 percent chance of dying you're like oh, i'm not doing that that's dangerous whereas if you say you've got a 90 percent chance of living you're like oh that's pretty good odds um so yeah if you say these uh, these animals are 90 percent not going to cause problems then people are much more likely to be in favor of it than if you say 10 percent chance of these animals causing problems um and there is a huge amount of education around that even even just around wildcats you know the fact that we don't know what wildcats are um, really affects people's attitudes to their reintroduction. Um, lynx and wolves are the interesting ones, which I don't know anything about, but I'll talk about anyway. Um, wolves have such an interesting history in our sort of cultural history that you know, the idea of reintroducing them is just so fraught. So one of the ideas for lynx reintroductions was just to say they're not wolves. That was this kind of way of making lynx reintroduction more palatable, um, which I think is really interesting in terms of framing. Uh, I, th I think we might get lynx eventually. Within my lifetime, wolves, no. Not, not unless there's some gorilla rewilding involved, <laughs> <laughs> which I am not ruling out. <laughs> okay, Villain, we have a time for one more quick question. Who wants to ask it? Yes? Um, I kind of want to bring you right back to your, the start of your presentation, when you said that you were previously working on rewilding predominantly and then yeah. have refocused to do reintroductions. Yeah. I was kind of under the impression that there's loads of different variations of what rewilding is and part of that can be reintroductions yeah. so it'd just be interested to know how you define it i know you said you didn't want to define it yeah. but you've got to have some impression of that yeah. murky landscape because it's like yeah. reintroductions rewilding restoration that all sort of come together so how do you yeah. approach it all i i think so those six factors that i said could sort of make something rewilding you notice reintroductions wasn't one of those. I think I think you can do rewilding without reintroducing anything. It might it will, might reintroduce itself, but you're not actively reintroducing anything. Um, that said, rewilding uh, reintroductions can definitely be a facet of, re of rewilding. Reintroductions sometimes are a facet of rewilding but also cannot be like i don't think every reintroduction has to be a case of rewilding i mean some people would say it is but like like the red kite reintroduction for example you know that was done 30 years ago long before rewilding was a particularly trendy term um isn't that just reintroduction maybe, maybe it's not maybe it is rewilding um, if, if the red kites were reintroduced now, do you think they'd be part of a rewilding project? It depends who was doing it. Yeah, like that's rewilding is such an interesting term. It's 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 basically trendy now, isn't it? You some some projects are still really avoiding it because of um, because of its negative connotations, because it makes people scared. Some people are calling everything rewilding because it gets in the news. Um, so I, it, it definitely depends who was doing it, but I think some people, yeah, if they were reintroducing red kites, they'd be like, we're rewilding Britain, rewilding red kites. Yeah, 
Definitely. Great. Well, on that note, thank you again for this Keep it online. If you have any more questions, then feel free to, then feel free to send them to us and we'll pass them on to Jenny. Um, otherwise, thank you everyone for coming. There was actually the bank going on in the chat. We mentioned that the pools were debating with each other. Um, uh, we were having Who's Tim alone? I like Tim alone. Uh, always Um, so it was Ashton, Tim alone, and Ben. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.